Uh, good morning. I'm Guy Land, Chief of Staff at the Appalachian Regional Commission, and I welcome you to this uh, workshop on accessing federal resources for our economic and community development. We're delighted to have you with us today. Uh, our goal is to uh, equip you with additional information for how you and your community can uh, tap into federal resources to help you accomplish the visions and dreams that you have for your communities. We are delighted that you've taken the time to come and spend the day with us. Uh, we've assembled a stellar team of uh, federal agencies to be here with us. Uh, we have, uh, counting ARC, seven participating federal agencies today. Uh, I can't document this, but my suspicion is that this is the largest gathering of federal agencies at one time in one place in Mississippi to talk about available federal resources, at least in North Mississippi. Uh, and so we very much appreciate our federal partners joining with us on this and think that uh, all of you from communities across Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, uh, will seize this opportunity to talk to the federal folks that are here about how they can partner with you in achieving some goals for your communities. This morning, today, we're hoping to do, cover, do things in about three different ways to help you do that. The first is a series of presentations that will lay out for you some of the federal programs that are offered, what you need to do to apply them, what the deadlines are, what the strategies for success are. Uh, a second item for the day will be a discussion of a case study back pra best practice, uh, a community effort that has cobbled together federal resources from almost a dozen different sources to really move the region forward economically. And then an opportunity for networking, for all of you to have some one-on-one -on -one time with the federal representatives that are here to talk with them about your plans and ask about whether what you're thinking about matches up with some of their funding opportunities. So we have built some time into the schedule for that as well. That may turn out to be the most valuable part of the program for many of you. Uh, we, uh, as I say, we hope at the end of the day when you leave, you'll have a better sense of where some federal resources are that can help you and your community move forward. It is, I think, particularly appropriate that we conduct this session on the campus of Mississippi State University because I suspect that Mississippi State has a long and rich relationship and partnership with every one of those participating federal agencies that are up there. Uh, so it seems like this is just a great place to do this because the, the, the university itself em, embodies the kind of partnerships with the feds that we are talking about doing. And we are particularly delighted to have uh, with us today representing the university, uh, Amy Tuck, uh, who understands what communities in the ARC part of Mississippi face in looking at economic challenges because she is from here. Uh, where we are is Octavia Hall County. That is where Amy is from. She is not, however, from the big metropolis of Starkville. Rather, she is from a much smaller community, Mabin, which is just at the far edge of the county. Uh, and so she understands in a very practical way what the challenges are facing rural communities across the ARC region, which is outlined on the map there. Uh, Amy began her career in public service by being in the Mississippi Senate for five years, representing this county and uh, most of the adjacent county, which happens to be my home county of Webster. Uh, she was elected lieutenant governor in 1999 and served two terms as lieutenant governor. When she was reelected for her second term, she had over 60% uh, over of the vote. Uh, the Mississippi law term limited the lieutenant governor and so when her second term expired, Mississippi State quickly realized they had a great Octavia Hall County asset right in their backyard and they latched on to Amy to work directly in the president's office. And uh, so Governor Tuck is the executive director for campus operations at Mississippi State, which ranges from the condition of the grounds to housing to major events on campus. Uh, and the thing that I think is also important is another hat she wears because it fits in with our mission, our message today, and that is she is the current board chairman of the Greater Starkville Development Partnership, which is a, a broader effort to promote economic development opportunity uh, in the Starkville region. And so, uh, Governor Tuck, we are so pleased to have you with us today. Well, good morning and welcome to Bulldog Country. 
We're excited that you're here this morning, and on behalf of our outstanding president, Dr. Mark Keenum, I extend to you an official welcome to this outstanding conference. And it is most impressive when you look at the uh, invitees and participants that are here today. Uh, we are delighted that you have chosen Mississippi State to uh, have your conference this morning. Uh, of course, you are a very special organization, and we're very honored to welcome all of you to Mississippi State today for what I know will be a productive day of workshops. You're covering lots of territory today, from grant writing to workforce and business development. This workshop really is about work. We're especially pleased that you're having this meeting on our campus because we share so many common values and common goals in moving our state and our region ahead. So thank you for being here and thank you for focusing on topics of such importance. These technical assistance workshops will be especially significant in helping states like ours, helping our states to become better prepared to link in to federal funding opportunities that can help boost economic development and the quality of life in our communities. Through your efforts, I know regional and community planners, chamber of commerce, nonprofits, and others will be more educated about the effective grant proposals and ways to match their community's needs to the specific needs of funding agencies. So I hope this is one of your most productive workshops ever. Like the Appalachian Regional Commission, Mississippi State is committed through teaching, research, service, outreach to some of your same broad goals. Like you, we want to see job opportunities and economic capacities increase in our region. Like each one of you, we want our graduates and the workforce of our area to be ready to compete in an increasingly demanding global marketplace. And like each of you, we want to see a strong infrastructure that can support the needs of citizens, communities, and industry. We're pleased to be partnering with you on some specific projects to help accomplish these goals. And we thank you especially for your support of our immediate Golden Triangle region for the infrastructure needs, such as improved sewer and water systems, the 911 emergency upgrades, strategic planning for very small communities without the technical resources to do so on their own. Under the leadership of Mike Armour, in Mississippi, the commission has had a tremendous impact in North and East Central Mississippi. 12 of the 24 counties served by ARC in Mississippi are considered at risk. We salute Mike Armour. We salute him for his remarkable track record at making a difference in this region. Mississippi State is proud to partner with you and make a difference. I want to just list a few points of pride that we have here on our campus for those of you who may not be aware of it. We have under the wonderful leadership of Dr. Keenum, so many great accomplishments. Mississippi State was recently recognized as one of the top 20 colleges and universities nationwide for military personnel and veterans. Our president, Dr. Keenum, is serving as a three-year trustee for the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges. Mississippi State received Last, last year, the Community Engagement Classification, which was awarded by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Seven, of Miss, seven Mississippi State graduates are presidents of our state community colleges. And just a few more. The Center for Advanced Vehicular Systems Extension Office earned the 2010 Award of Excellence in Business Assistance and Entrepreneurship presented by the National University Economic Development Association. We are only one of 108 universities nationwide and recognized in 2010 as a very high research activity university by the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Mississippi State holds more than 175 patents. I could go on and on and on. We are proud of the accomplishments that we are achieving at Mississippi State, and we are equally pleased that you are here on this campus. Today, I hope all of you can benefit from the extensive knowledge of leaders such as Guy Land and our leader, Mike Armour, 
and key agency representatives who will have invaluable insights to share with each of you. Through opportunities like this, our communities become stronger, our region becomes better positioned to be an economic force to be reckoned with. So I thank you for taking your time to be here today to learn more of what can benefit everyone in our region. We salute your efforts and we hope that you'll leave Mississippi State knowing that we're committed towards working those same great goals that you adhere to. Thank you and go dogs. Thank you so much, Governor Tuck. Uh, one of the, the, the lead partner with ARC in putting on these uh, workshops, and this is the first of three that we'll be doing across the region, is the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, and they have been a real terrific ally in this and have uh, uh, really made these, these workshops a, a driving force on their agenda. Uh, AR, uh, ARC has always enjoyed a strong partnership with USDA. In fact, we do more projects with USDA than with any other federal agency. And uh, we are very pleased to have with us this morning, uh, is to give us a USDA welcome and perspective, the Mississippi State Director for Rural Development at USDA, Trina George. Uh, USDA has over 40 programs affecting housing and uh, business and community infrastructure and facilities, and all of those in Mississippi go through uh, Trina's hands. Uh, they are uh, terrific on the ground folks that I suspect many of you in this room have worked with. Uh, Trina has been the State Director since uh, June of 2009 when she was appointed by the President. Prior to that, she had worked for about 15 years, I think, uh, as the projects manager and other activities for Congressman Benny Thompson uh, from the 2nd Congressional District. In fact, Congressman Thompson has one ARC County, Montgomery, in his district. Uh, and uh, the thing that, uh, that is also important to me is she is from uh, Grenada County. It's not an ARC County, but it is surrounded on three sides by ARC counties. Uh, Montgomery, Webster, uh, Calhoun, and Yalabusha. Uh, so she understands the kinds of problems that everybody in this room faces, and we are particularly pleased to have Trina George come and join us today on behalf of USDA Rural Development. Good morning to everybody. First of all, I do want to give a, a big thanks to Dr. Keenan and his, his entire staff for allowing us to host this event here today. He's always welcoming. I, I think I've been over here in the last month about three or four times, so that tells you how well they work with the public and, and how well they try to get the information out to the people. Uh, secondly, I want to thank Mike and the entire staff of um, ARC for thinking of this event. Because today, now more than ever, we need to work together. We need to partner together as, a, as, a, as citizens and as nonprofits to work on behalf of the communities in which we serve. But before I go any further, I do want to introduce some special guests we have. We have other state directors with us here today, and I want to ask them to stand as I call their names, and they're going to be speaking at a later time in the program. But I do want to ask uh, Ms. Vernita Dorr. She's the state director for South Carolina for rural development. I also want to ask Mr. Ronnie Davis to stand, please. He's the State Director for Rural Development for Alabama. And I also want to ask Mr. Donnie Thomas to stand. He's the Acting State Director from Georgia. As Guy indicated already, rural development have over 40 programs that we serve the community with. We actually build a community from the ground up. That's what we're known for. And so as you're here today, you're going to hear uh, infrastructure, business programs from rural development. And I hope that you get everything that you need to take back to your communities in order to build your communities. So on behalf of USDA Rural Development, and also, oh Lord have mercy, I cannot forget this person. I would like to ask Madly Abdullah to please stand. <laughs> please stand. <laughs> He has been so instrumental in helping rural development pull this together and what we're going to play, what, what part we're going to play here at Mississippi State at our ARC um, workshop today. But again, on behalf of rural development and all of the state directors here, as well as the, uh, the 
area directors and program directors that you'll be meeting with rural development here today. We welcome you to Mississippi and we hope that you get everything that you hope to out of this workshop and thank you for having us. Thanks so much Trina and the entire USDA team that's here today. The Appalachian Regional Commission is a federal state partnership consisting of a federal official appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate, and that's Earl Gold from whom you'll hear shortly, and the governors of the 13 states that we serve. Uh, Mississippi Governor Haley Barber has been a very strong and active partner in ARC. Uh, when uh, he was the lead governor among the governors in 2008, he brought ARC to Tupelo for a formal meeting and for a two-day workshop on workforce development issues in Mississippi and surrounding the region. And one of the first things that uh, Governor Barber did after he was elected was to appoint Mike Armour as the director of the Mississippi Appalachian Regional Commission office in Tupelo. And uh, you've already heard from Governor Tuck about uh, uh, Mike's vigorous commitment to the needs of Northeast Mississippi. Uh, all of us at ARC in Washington know that on a day in and day out basis. Uh, Mike uh, is a real champion for our local communities across this area and a real advocate for the work that you're doing and a, a very enthusiastic partner with you. Prior to his work at, uh, at ARC, he was in the banking business. He was a vice president for what was then People's Bank for eight years and then before that he was uh, with Ford Motor Company including at one part of the time in their Ford Credit Company division and then he was uh, working for them on the lobbying front in Washington uh, a number of years ago. Uh, the most important thing for this setting though is that Mike is an extremely proud alumnus of Mississippi State University. Uh, in fact the, uh, the only way that state would let us use this facility or make it available to us was if we agreed that the majority of the opening speakers had degrees or went to Mississippi State. Uh, Trina has a master's in uh, instructional technology. Uh, Governor Tuck did her undergrad and master's work here. Uh, Mike's undergrad degree is here. Uh, I didn't, don't have a degree here, but I did go to summer school here. Uh, so, uh, so it is my uh, uh, delight personal pleasure to uh, introduce to you Mike Armour, the head of the uh, Mississippi ARC office in Tupelo. Thank you, Guy. I appreciate those words. Uh, hey, a bit of housekeeping. Of course, the restrooms are out here on the right, refreshments in the back. want to keep it relaxed and low-key today, so you're welcome to get up and leave. Uh, but we got a great show today. I want to take no credit for putting this together. It was ARC Washington, Tom Hunter, Earl Go, and the whole team, Kerry, the Washington put this together. We agreed to host it, so we appreciate the opportunity to do this. Uh, Guy, thanks for Mississippi Native and all, doing all you do for us in Washington. And uh, Trina and myself worked together for many years. Whenever we had a project over in her region, I'd call her and she'd call me. We worked together on it. Congressman Thompson always very, very supportive of it. So I appreciate working together. So. Uh, didn't want to say good morning. It's a beautiful day. Welcome to God's country. Uh, on behalf of Governor Haley Barber, I'd like to welcome each of you here today. My boss, uh, Patrick Sullivan, the governor's alternate, also gets sends his regards. Uh, uh, beautiful campus, voted one of the most beautiful landscape campuses in America several times through the years. Uh, Dr. Keenum, thanks to everybody for helping, uh, welcoming us and, and providing this facility for us. Uh, I want to start out by, uh, as Governor Barber says, this is a team sport. Uh, everybody working together. I want to thank our congressional delegation. Of course, they're the ones that, that puts the money up for ARC. Uh, from uh, Senator Cochran's office, I think uh, Mindy Maxwell and Bill Canney. Senator Wicker's office, we've got Drew Robertson. Uh, Governor Harper, I mean, uh, Congressman Harper's office, I think uh, Hank Mosley may be here. Uh, Congressman Alan Nunley, we got Walt Starr and Kelly Jackson, and Congressman Thompson sends his regards also. But uh, we'd, we'd, if y'all are here, would y'all stand up? Let's give y'all a hand. Here's Walt, <laughs> Kelly. We, we appreciate the support from our congressional delegation. Uh, now for our planning and development districts. We work hand in hand on projects with them. All our PDD folks, would y'all please stand? Planning and development folks. After, after this is over with, uh, 
my, the most important person, one of the most important people in here to me is Sandra Perkins. Sandra, would you stand? She's the one that actually runs the show. And uh, Vanita's in the office in Tupelo covering the bases there. So Sandra or me or anybody from the PDDs, if you're in the 24 ARC County of Mississippi, please see us for any questions afterwards. But uh, we really appreciate all you do. Uh, our partners, MDA, TVA, Rural Development, HUD, NMIDA, EDA, we, all these acronyms, uh, it took me a long time to get used to them, but we got a good group of folks we work with. Uh, uh, while I'm thinking, I want to thank the ARC Washington folks. Um, in Mississippi, we have anywhere from 40 to 45 projects a year. ARC Washington will process roughly 450, give or take, on any given year, and the wonderful job they do. We try to have it right, working with our PDDs when it gets there, so it'll slide through real quick. But uh, Tom Hunter, Executive Director, Tom, everybody knows Tom. Kerry, uh, Dr. Jeff Schwartz, where are you? Sue Moreland. But we appreciate y'all coming. Of course, Guy, uh, thanks for all y'all do. Uh, being coming from a banking world, uh, I guess in the banking world, you find a, a way to, to sometimes buy a loan or, or turn the loan down or make it as painless as possible. That's what we try to do at ARC. We try to, if we can't help them in one way, we try to go to plan B and work out another way to help them. So uh, make it as painless as possible. Uh, stick around for a great lunch program today something you'll really enjoy. Uh, and now I'm going to tell you a little bit about ARC Mississippi. Uh, from 1965 to 2010, ARC Mississippi has funded roughly 1,700 projects with $260 million invested directly. ARC is sometimes referred to as the glue that makes a project work. On average, it, Every $1 invested brings in another $9 in private and public investment. That increases the total impact to well over $2.3 billion since 1965 in Mississippi. The overall goal of ARC is to reduce the socioeconomic gap between the 13 state region and the rest of the country. The, uh, of course, there is 24 counties in Mississippi. In those particular counties, past five, past year, 5.583 million in ARC non-highway funds were invested matched by 5.5 million in other public funds, leveraging about 48 million in private funds. That activity supported creation or retention of over 2,000 jobs and provided training for over, over 4,000 student trainees. Investment equals opportunity plus training equals jobs. The four-year uh, record is noteworthy. In, four, in the past four years, Three, 30, over 31 million in ARC non-highways funds were invested, matched by 78 million in other public funds, and leveraging 493 total million private funds. This supported the creation or retention of 9,800 jobs, uh, provided training for well over 1,300 students and trainees, served 7,800 households with infrastructure improvements, and we completed. Uh, another area is Appalachian Development Highway System. I know we've got some folks from MDOT here. We work with them. Uh, we created, opened uh, 12.7 miles of ADHS Highway, Corridor X and Corridor V. Um, now, I get to introduce Earl Gold. Uh, glad to have you here, taking time out of your schedule to be with us. Earl Gold, ARC Federal Co-Chair, was unanimously confirmed as federal co-chair of the Appalachian Regional Commission by the U.S. Senate on March 10, 2010. He is 11th federal co-chair to be appointed since the commission was formed in 1965. Earl came to ARC with 20 years' experience in Pennsylvania and state and local government. From 96 to 2001, Earl served as special assistant, then as associate assistant secretary of the U.S. Department of Labor. <laughs> There, he was responsible for the development and implement implementation of a legislative strategy in the areas of immigration policy, employment standards, affirmative action, and federal worker compensation programs, and international affairs, including child labor and core labor standards. From 2001 to 2009, Earl was Director of Government Relations, Deputy Director for the Puerto Rico Federal Affairs Administration, where he formulated legislative and executive branch initiatives related to tax, economic security, health care, education, nutrition, environment, homeland security, labor, housing, and transportation. Uh, 
In a Senate confirmation hearing, Earl stated that his objective as ARC federal co-chair would be to ensure that each federal dollar expended by the commission was an investment in the economic future of Appalachian families that will generate a return for all taxpayers. On a personal note, Earl, it's been a pleasure working with you. Uh, he's always been there for us uh, to answer questions, to work out issues, and uh, let's give a warm Mississippi welcome to Federal Co-Chair Earl Go. Uh, thank you, Mike. I have, um, I have the best job in Washington, D.C. And the reason why it's the best job in Washington, D.C. is because I get to go and talk with people throughout the 420 counties about what their dreams are. And then we sit down and we try to figure out how to get there. And it's just an incredible experience. This session today is about making my job even more fun. Because of the challenges that we have going forward, there's going to be more competition for federal funds, not less. The pie is getting smaller, it's not getting bigger. And it's important that as you go forward, and as you look at your needs, you look for resources, that you be sharper, more competitive, tougher, tighter, more direct, and, more, and stronger in the way you present your case and the way you present your applications. That's the challenge that we have. Now, before, it's important to take note here to thank a few people for this event. First of all, to thank Mississippi State for hosting us, for Sandra and for Michael for putting up with us and letting us come to Mississippi again. It's also important to, to recognize my staff, the Guy Land and Carrie Kluke, who have been all out the last three weeks scrambling, working, trudging, panicking, figuring out uh, a strategy for getting this meeting together. And it is so good to see all of you. But it's also so important to thank the federal staff for being here. You realize that every federal staff that you, that you talk to today, when they left work on Friday, they weren't sure if they could go to work on Monday, let alone come to Starkville, Mississippi on Wednesday. So the, uh, the flexibility and the creativity that folks were able to demonstrate to get here today is hopefully something that we can build on as we go forward to try to fund some applications and move some, move some efforts forward. The reason we're here today is because the President of the United States, President Obama, said to the department agencies, you guys need to figure out how to work together much better than the way it's happened in the past. And by the way, when you work together, you also need to figure out, you can't forget these 420 counties over here called the Appalachian Regional Commission, the Appalachia. You need to figure out this is a high areas of unemployment, high areas of poverty, and we need to work in a way that takes not just ARC resources, but takes federal resources and invests them in these communities. And we went forward with something called, with something that was born, it's called the Appalachia Regional Development Initiative, where federal agencies sat down with, with ARC at the table, begin to talk about how to move forward. And the first thing that we did was we went out we had listening sessions throughout the region to talk to folks about their priorities, their challenges, and how the federal government should be responding to those. And one of the things that happened consistently at each one of the five sessions, someone would stand up and say, you know, I really need funds for X, or I need help in water, or I need something in training. And a federal official or a federal staffer would stand up on the other side of the room and say, well, you know what, we do that. We, we can help you with that. And it was a, that was the one consistent thing that happened at each one of the five sessions. And so in response to that, we said, well, what we need to do is come back again and have this conversation, not about what your dreams are, but about what is it we do. And begin to have a conversation among the federal agencies with local uh, leaders and local development agencies and, and local nonprofits about what we have to offer, what are the important points and how do you compete for those funds and how to go forward and how to, how to build on this. And so today's session is the first of three that are scheduled, six that we expect to have. We're starting here in Mississippi and we're going to work north as opposed to starting up in north and working south. Uh, but we're starting here today because we see this as a continuation 
of the conversation that we started last year. And we expect to be back again. And it's our hope that this is one more step, this is one more building block in ways to make sure that the 420 counties in Appalachia are competitive, that we get the resources, the federal resources that are so important to our growth and our development, and then as the pie grows tighter and smaller, that we don't lose out, and that we're at the table, and that we are, are able to identify our needs, articulate our challenges, and work for our share of federal funds in a very competitive and a very aggressive way. After all, that's part of the ARC's mission, is to be a convener, to be an advocate, not only a funder. So I'm hopeful that today will be a great day for all of us, and we're looking forward to this session and being back in Mississippi very soon. Thank you all for coming. It's good to see you. Thanks, Earl. There are a few federal officials that, uh, staff that are here that have not been recognized, and since part of what we want you to do is feel comfortable grabbing any federal person that's here to talk about something that you're interested in in their areas, I want to recognize them. Uh, Mike has already identified the ARC staff that are here. Uh, Trina has uh, identified the uh, USDA contingent. We have a couple of folks from the U.S. Department of Edu Education, John White, who is Deputy Assistant Secretary for Outreach, uh, and Adrian Dunbar, who is a Special Assistant to the Assistant Secretary for Adult and Vocational Education, uh, and uh, they're with us there. Uh, we have uh, from the Department of Labor, from uh, the Employment and Training Administration, Levy Thompson, who is a Workforce Development Specialist uh, out of Atlanta. Uh, from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, we have Dr. Jackie Williams, who is head of the Office of Rural Housing and Economic Development. She is based in Washington, but Jackie's roots are Mississippi. She is from, uh, from Madison County. Uh, and uh, with her is Donetta McAdoo, who is the Senior Representative for Community Planning and Development out of the Jackson Hood office. Uh, we have uh, Jonathan Corso from EDA, from the Economic Development Administration of the Department of Commerce. He is from Atlanta. He is the uh, Georgia Economic Development Representative, and we're delighted to have him with us. And from the Small Business Administration, we have Rhonda Fisher, who is the uh, Supervising uh, Lending Relations Specialist out of the SBA office in Jackson. And uh, I believe we're going to have uh, Doug Gurley. I'm not sure whether he is, uh, he is here who uh, is the director of the Mississippi Small Business Development Centers, which have the cooperative agreement arrangement with SBA to provide technical assistance to small businesses in the region. Uh, so those are the federal folks who are here today. Uh, we hope that you will feel free to, to uh, talk with them at any of the break times or the networking sessions about how their resources can match up with your needs. And uh, what we're going to do, we're going to, to break into three uh, workshop sessions these are self-identify. There's the workforce development, there is the infrastructure, and there's the small business development. And it's uh, whichever ones you wish to go to, those you go to. We're going to do a block of them this morning, and then we're going to repeat them this afternoon. So you, if you stay all day, you can go to two of them. Uh, they'll be the very same content. It's nothing different unless the Q&A is different, which is potentially possible. Uh, we're going to, there's a divider that is the space between those two sets of tables there is a divider that comes down. This part will be, where I'm standing, will be the uh, business development session. The other side over there toward the window will be the infrastructure session. And just outside the, the door will be uh, the workshop for workforce development. So that's what we're going to do once we uh, get ready to go into our roll up our sleeves session. To help lay the foundation for this, we thought it would be useful if we did a quick little overview, sort of a grant writing 101, to make sure everybody's kind of on the same page on what are the keys to successful grant writing. And uh, it is uh, uh, my pleasure to introduce a member of the ARC staff, Dr. Jeffrey Swartz. Uh, Jeff has been with ARC for about a dozen years. He is our education program manager, uh, but he has done in his career as an independent consultant and even with ARC, a lot of training of uh, working with communities on grant preparation and things of that sort. Uh, and so Jeff has agreed to come and do a little quick uh, grant writing 101. We're passing out the hard copy of his PowerPoint. And while that's occurring, it's an opportunity for me to say that we are videotaping all of the sessions today and they will be put on our website 
uh, for this activity, which is www.arc.gov forward slash ARDI, stands for Appalachian Regional Development Initiative. Uh, the cautionary word about this, it is being videotaped, it will be on the web, so uh, be on good behavior. <laughs> and uh, because once on the web, it lists, it, it remains in perpetuity. Uh, so uh, with that, let me uh, bring forward uh, Dr. Jeff Schwartz. Thank you and good morning. Give me a minute here to just switch presentations. That went pretty fast. I was told that I needed to be dynamic and I said, well, I'm just speaking about money. People tend to listen anyway. What I'm gonna be doing today is a very short, a 10 minute segment from an all day workshop that I've given around the region. I think I've done one in Mississippi a few years ago. I've done several in Alabama, New York, and other places on basics of grant writing. How do you go about identifying a grant and seeking it? If you're interested in the full long day work, day long workshop, let me know later, we can talk about it. Or in Mississippi, talk to Mike. In Alabama, talk to Bonnie Durham, the, his counterpart there, or the ARC program manager from your state. Um, given that it's only 10 minutes, I can either cut down content or I can talk faster. I've had enough caffeine. I think I'm gonna talk a little faster today. If you have questions, grab me later. One of the things about grant making, I see that some of you out here look like you've written a proposal or two already that you may not be newbies at this. So I'm gonna focus on some recent shifts over the past couple of years. All federal agencies and private funders as well have become very mission driven, very mission driven. And it's important that you identify your goals and how they align with the agency's mission. There's also a focus on uh, accountability, and I think you've heard that word a few times, and accountability means outcomes. So I'm going to spend my time talking about identifying of outcomes. We're going to talk about grant making as a journey. Before I get into that, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. One, grant making is short-term funding. If you don't have your long-term funding plan in place, that's a bigger issue. You need to worry about that first. There are a couple of uses for it. Generally, it's for startup or expansion. It's not for ongoing operations. You want to have an, a grant to help you do something special to get something started. If short-term funding is not the same as immediate funding, I know that with the state of the budget now, a lot of us are in a budget crunch. If you need the money right now, it's generally too late to apply for a grant. The process typically takes, it used to be a year, the federal process has gotten a little bit better now. It's about six months to a year from the time you send in your application until you get that first check. And I always look at a grant application as a working draft. When I was doing private consulting and writing applications, I told my clients, don't expect the first application to get funded. You write that, you get comments back, you revise it, you send in it again, and you just keep revising it until you are successful. Just remember, it's not the same as a long-term funding plan. You have to have that in place first. When I talk about outcomes, and we need to identify those before we go looking for the funding, traditionally what people did is we said, well, what do you have money to do, and I'll do that. We don't work that way anymore in the federal government, at least not at ARC, and I think my colleagues out there would agree with me at their agencies. Figure out what it is that you need to get done how you're going to do it, and then try to find the money to help you get there. And sometimes it's not always money that you need. There are other resources that can be just as valuable. Don't forget about those either. When I talk about outcomes, we're talking about things that you can see, feel, and not just know, but what you can actually measure, a change that's going to take place. We want to keep them focused on the student. Well, I'm an educator, so I keep them focused on the students or the workers or on the businesses. What are they going to be able to do because of this funding that they couldn't do before they got it? In an education example, the outcome, we don't want to purchase computers. That's a means to an end. We want to have students who are better prepared to do a job or better trained because they had those computers. So what we might say is we'll have 50 students in a training program. At least 42 of them are going to get certified to do the job. 
While I'm in education, I also work with economic development, my colleagues down the hall from me and from other agencies, and that's what our goal is. One of the things we want to do is we want to have companies that have new export sales that brings money into a region and means that they're going to hire new people. And notice that I have specific numbers in each of these outcomes. We don't just want to say, oh, we're going to create some jobs and we'll tell you how many later. You need to project those numbers of jobs up front. Here's another example, again, specific numbers. Training people, creating new businesses, creating new jobs. And it works for infrastructure too. Sometimes it's easier to get those specific numbers with infrastructure. If we're gonna put in some water fi pipe or fiber optic cable, how many jobs are we gonna get because of that? Remember, money is only one of the resources that you need, and it may not be your most important resource. A lot of federal agencies give away things other than money. A lot of corporations, a lot of foundations will provide other resources to you that will enable you to get the job done better than you could without them. So don't just keep your eye on the dollar signs. Keep an eye on what you need to do with them. Sometimes the networking that you do, and we've built a lot of networking time into this conference, into this session today, the networking that you do can be as important, if not more important, than the applications that you write. Knowing who to send the application to is going to be a very, very helpful thing to know. Once you've figured out what it is you want to do, what your outcomes will be, one place to start your search is at grants.gov. Now, these handouts are going to be so small, don't, please don't try to read them. Unless you're about eight or nine years old and you really like to challenge your eyes on that. But what you do need is that big print at the top that says grants.gov, because that is the website. And if you look down the left side of the screen, I believe it's highlighted in red there, it gives you different ways that you can search, different things that you can look for. And if you go down to the bottom of that screen, It'll tell you that you can look for grant opportunities and how to get started. If you're going to use grants.gov for an application, you need to register with the site. It's free, but it's not always fast. It sometimes takes a couple of days, and so if there's a tight grant deadline, register in advance. If you just want to get on and play around and look at what's available, you can do that without registering. You can see everything up there. But if you're even thinking about doing a grant, my suggestion is that you register first. Because when it comes down to it and you need to send those forms in, you don't want to have to all of a sudden, oh, how do I get my number? How do I do this? You want to have all that set up in advance. I love these four tabs. And I'm just going to click on the first one, finding grant opportunities. If you go to basic search, you can put in whatever keywords you think might use, workforce, infrastructure. The more keywords you use, the narrower your search. I suggest you just start with something very general like workforce or training or infrastructure. See what comes up. You can also browse by category or agency. I just put in training. And if you just put in training, you can see that there are 672 results that came out of there. Start going through those, find some that look interesting, and that'll give you an idea of what some other keywords are that you can use to find some other resources. Now, I'm not going to go through up here and show you all 672 of these. But if you look at the last column on the left, it says the open date. That is the date that it became available. Federal grants are typically open for 30, 60, 90 days. Some of them are open on a rolling basis. But if it doesn't have, if we're here in March already and it doesn't have the current year, it might be an annual thing that you want to look at, but it's not something for applying right now. When it comes time to actually writing the proposal, it's not something you want to do on your own. 
It can be done by one person. I've done it. It takes a lot of work. You don't get a whole lot of sleep for about a week or two. But you get a much better job and a much better result if you work on it in a team. And I often tell people you want two teams, one that does all the work and another one that knows nothing about it until after the proposal is done and then they proofread it for you. As you're going through the steps, you want to bring in all your stakeholders. And please, speaking as a grant making agency, tailor your proposal to that agency. I hate to tell you how many times I get a proposal where the cover page says ARC and you turn it over to page one and it says USDA. Nothing against USDA, but they have different programs than we do. Use that agency's language. When my colleagues and I sit down and we chat over lunch, we talk about what we're doing, we often have to interpret for each other or translate what we're doing because the language that I use at ARC is not the same that John uses at U.S. Department of Education or that Migday uses at USDA. Go on that agency's website, learn their language, speak their language, it'll make your proposal better understood by them and give you a better chance of getting some funding from them. I'm going to skip this one. I think the one thing I want to just hit is that middle point. If there's something on the application that you don't understand, something in the request for proposals that's not quite clear, do what you always tell your children, what I always told my students, never assume anything. That's a dangerous thing to do. Call, ask. There's almost always a name or a contact or an email on there where you can call and get that information answered. Some of the common errors. Many applications now must be submitted electronically, yet people still want to fax them or send a hard copy in the mail. Follow the directions. Over half of all applications submitted don't get funded because somebody didn't follow the directions. That includes too many pages. I have a colleague who told me I couldn't use his name or his foundation, but he told me that they have a little intern that they pay to sit at the mailroom when they get in applications. She counts the number of pages. Anything over 20, it gets tossed aside and they get a little postcard back that says, thank you for your application, we'll be in touch. Nobody ever reads it. Anything smaller than a 12 point font or less than one inch margins, gets tossed aside, never read, little postcard goes in the mail. Follow those directions. And I asked my colleague at the foundation, why are you being so petty? He goes, well, if they can't follow those simple directions, how do I know they can take care of my money? Oftentimes, people omit a section, and that's so easy to do when you're working in a word processor and putting things together piece by piece. Make sure it's all there. Use your checklist. Cut and paste errors. When people cut from one proposal and put it into another and all of a sudden I get the wrong budget that doesn't make any sense for the application I'm looking at. Poor English, spelling and grammar mistakes. Technically, points don't get taken off for them, but hey, these are all read by humans. They're read by people. And don't hold it against me, but I'm a former English teacher. That's going to have an, that's going to have an effect. If I see something, if it's a lot of misspellings, strange grammar, or if you're using a lot of jargon, if you're talking about MSU, MSU, I'm from Washington, D.C. I come to Mississippi, what, two, three times a year, Mike? I may not remember what MSU is. Spell it out. Don't make me work too hard to do it. You want to get on the good side of the person who's reviewing that grant, whether it's at Department of Ed, USDA, or wherever it is. Okay. Again, follow the directions. Don't give up. Keep going for it. And let me just get to the most important slide. If you have any questions, feel free to give me a call. And if you have questions about anything with ARC, feel free to use my phone number or email. And if I'm not the right one to answer it, I'll forward it to the one who is. Might be Tom, might be Earl, might be Sue Moreland, might be one of my other colleagues. Thank you.